This conference will now be recorded. Okay, good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. This is Minister Jerry Spencer from Bank Street Memorial Baptist Church in Norfolk, Virginia. Again, brothers and sisters, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I want to thank everyone this morning for uh, dialing in <clears throat> and I pray that you've had a blessed week. I pray that God has blessed you and your family and I, I want to thank God for blessing us all to be here this day to continue the study of his word and to get a better understanding of the word of God and to spiritually grow in the word of God. That is the mission of the International Adult Bible Study which is to bring men and women to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through the study and the teaching of the Word of God. And with that, brothers and sisters, let us just take a moment and uh, have a word of prayer. So let us pray. For Heavenly Father, and heaven, we ask and pray now, Father, that you would now guide this Bible study ministry, open the hearts of each one who is listening. I pray now, Father, that the Holy Spirit would take full control of this Bible study ministry. I pray this now in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> excuse me. Our scripture will be uh, coming from John chapter 4, uh, verses uh, 7 through 15, 28 through 30, and 39 through 41. Very interesting study this week. We've talked about the Samaritan woman in the past and we've had different um you know from different gospels this uh this week's study will be coming from the gospel of john and a key verse comes from john chapter 4 verse 39 many of the samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony Told, he told me everything I ever did. Now, that phrase, he told me everything I ever did. We're going to talk about that later on because that, that's going to be um, something that we need to pay attention to. And we'll get to I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but we're going to get to that in a few minutes. Again, the title of today's uh, biblical study is Jesus Talks with a Samaritan Woman. And, excuse me, next week, we will be in the book of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, verses 1 through 13 and 18 through 20. So with that, brothers and sisters, let us go ahead and look at our biblical uh, historical background. To get a better understanding of today's lesson, we need to understand a little of the history of Samaria. Now, I believe that many of you have some knowledge already of, of Samaria. Um, but we're going to get into a little of this history and the relationship between the Samaritans and the Jews of Jesus' day. <clears throat> After the death of King Solomon around 931 BC, the nation of Israel, the 12 nation of Israel, was split into two parts, uh, later, uh, later called Northern and Southern Kingdoms. Now, this was due in part because of the idolatrous acts of Jeroboam. The Northern Kingdom, which consisted of the 10 tribes, the, the first 10 tribes, was later referred to as Israel. Those were the first 10 tribes of, of, uh, of, of uh, Jacob. While the Southern Kingdom consisted of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And that kingdom, that southern kingdom was called um, the, the, uh, the, um, the tribe of Judah. Amre, king of Israel, built the city of Samaria on a hill to be his capital around uh, 875 BC. It was there that he and his infamous son Ahab ruled and established the city as a lasting site. But because of their persistent idolatry and false religious practices, God's wrath fell upon them 
whereby divine judgment resulted in the destruction of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians. And this happened around 722 BC. And it says that the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, from Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and Zephyrbaim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they took possession of Samaria and dwelt in its city. Now, this is important, as you will see in a moment. It was this interracial relationship or these interracial relationships of other nations and races with that of the Israelites that were left from the, uh, the Northern Kingdom that eventually led to the blue blood, what we call the blue blood Jews of the Southern Kingdom of Judah, disdain for the now racially mixed people. In other words, they didn't want to have anything to do with them because they were now um, they were now interracially uh, married or had interracial you know, children. But to be clear, brothers and sisters, the Samaritans worshiped the God of Israel and were also waiting for the Messiah. But they had accepted only the first five books of the Old Testament as their scripture, as opposed to the Hebrew Bible, which began from Genesis and ends in Chronicles. They had even built uh, their own temple to worship. And that temple was uh, located at Mount Gerizim, which the Jews destroyed in uh, 128 BC instead of the temple of Jerusalem. So they had built their own temple. They started worshiping in that temple at Gerizim, Gerizim and uh, instead of the temple that was at Jerusalem. Now that we have a little background on Samaritan's our, our ancient history, let's kind of move forward to the first century of Jesus's day leading up to our study for today. Samaria, um, was uh, the, the region that sat to the north of Judah, which is located in the south and south of Galilee. Um, in other words, it was kind of sandwiched in between uh, Galilee to its north and Judea to its south. Although going through Samaria meant a, a quicker route for, uh, from Galilee to, to Judea, the Jews would instead take the longer route around that region. They wanted nothing to do with the Samaritans, not even having the dust of the ground uh, on their sandals because they saw them as being unclean, if you will. It goes on to say that while in Judea, Jesus was making his disciples uh, and his disciples were, were uh his disciples rather were uh, being baptized or baptizing rather more people than John the Baptist. So when the Lord knew that the, the, the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, he and his disciples left the southern region of Judea and headed north towards Galilee. Now, the scripture says he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, Sychar and some historic, historians call it Shechem. Uh, it was near the plot of land that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Now, Jacob's well, well was there, it says. And as they traveled, Jesus, being wearied from his journey, sat down by the well around noontime. And so what we see is, if it, my screen will move forward here for a second, we can get to this next section. The phrase was one of a number of emphasis in the gospel. And let me just shoot, shoot back here just for a moment. I think we may have skipped, skipped one area. Um, let's see here. Okay. 
So it goes on to say that this was this phrase was a number of, in, of, of intentional emphasis in the gospel that underlined the humanity of the Savior. In other words, Jesus was wearied from his journey. And so when the scriptures write that Jesus needed to go through Samaria, it may not have been for divine purposes or reasons, but of necessity, since it was the shorter route to getting to Galilee. Now, unlike the Jews of Jesus's day, who had no association with Samaritans, Jesus had come to do what, brothers and sisters? He came to save that which was lost. This included Samaritans as well. And just as he did not shy away from those who had leprosy, those that were blind, those that were lame, tax collectors and sinners, Jesus was not going to disassociate himself with Samaritans either. For when he came, he says, the scripture tells us, he came to save that which was lost. And so this takes us to our study for this morning. In John chapter four, verses seven through nine, it says, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus sat, uh, said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask a drink of me, a Samaritan woman. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And so his disciples now gone to get food. This was around noontime. Jesus has sat down by the well to rest. As the scripture says, he was wearied from his journey. A woman of Samaria, had come by shortly afterwards to draw water from what the scriptures call Jacob's well. Well, we can assume that she had gone there many times with her bucket to draw water, brothers and sisters. In the culture of that day, Jewish men were careful concerning having conversations with women um, <clears throat> with whom they were not familiar. Uh, whether they were Jew or Gentiles. Now, Jesus saw that the Samaritan woman had the means of getting the water out of the well. So he asked her for a drink. Now, this is remarkable in that, first of all, although being God and the person of Christ, Jesus allowed himself to experience what it was like to be tired and weary. Secondly, when our Lord had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry and he was tempted by Satan to turn stone into bread. Our Lord refused and quoted Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. He did this, brothers and sisters, for a reason. At the wedding in Cana, Jesus turned water into wine so that the hosts of the wedding could continue celebrating. He did that for a purpose. When Jesus caused uh, the five loaves and the two fishes to multiply in order to feed over 5,000 people, and we find that in Mark chapter 6, verses 41 through 44, he did that for a purpose, for a reason. You will not find in the scriptures where Jesus did something miraculously for himself only, for his own personal uh, uh, reasons. You will not find that, brothers and sisters. Just as Moses struck the rock and water came gushing out of it in Exodus chapter 17, verse 6, which was a type of Christ, Jesus could have spoken to the stones nearby that day and water would have came gushing out. After all, he had authority over all things. 
Now, when our Lord asked for water that day, the woman of Samaria immediately identifies him as being a Jew. Now, it could have been the way that he was dressed or his speech or whatever. But she says to Jesus, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, Jesus doesn't give her a direct answer. Instead, he replies with the words that were completely unexpected. In verses in, in John chapter 4, verses 10 through 15, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, he says, and who it is, and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. And so, in her mind, brothers and sisters, she sees a man of Jewish descent who seems to be in the wrong part of town, you see. She's curious as to how he even found his way to Jacob's well, seeing that the Jews make every effort not to travel on Samaritan soil <clears throat> and to engage in a conversation with a Samaritan woman whom the Jews claim to be unclean was unheard of. Jesus made every effort to go, Jews rather, Jews made every effort to go around that region rather than walk through it to get to Galilee or to get to Judea. To that extent, brothers and sisters, the woman sounds offensive, you see and slightly hostile towards Jesus. When our Lord begins to make statements that she can't spiritually grasp, she gives a natural response. And we would probably do the same thing because we don't yet understand what our Lord is saying. So when the woman says, the woman asks, she says, how is it that you being a Jew ask drink of me, a Samaritan woman? Jesus replies not by answering her question regarding her comment about him being a Jew, but speaks of a gift that was sent from God. Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God and who it was or who it is who says to you, give me a drink, Jesus says, you would have asked him, he says, and he would have given you living water. Now, the gift, if you will, spoken of, brothers and sisters, is Christ Jesus himself, according to John chapter 3, verse 16. And that living water, being a picture used in the Old Testament of divine activity in giving life to men, speaks of the Holy Spirit. One of the evils the people of God had committed, according to Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, was that they had forsaken the Lord. 
It says in, in Jeremiah chapter 32, chapter 2, verse 13, the fountain of living waters. So what they're saying, what Je or Jeremiah is saying is that they have forsaken the Lord who was the fountain of living waters. And in John chapter 7, verses 38 and 39, Jesus plainly says that he who believes in me, as the scriptures has said, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who was not yet given. Why? Because, or rather, <clears throat> because Jesus was not yet glorified. And so we know from reading Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2 that the truth of Jesus' words would come to pass at Pentecost. We know this to be true. As with anyone hearing Jesus' words for the first time, the woman hears him but has no knowledge of this gift that Jesus spoke of, no knowledge of who this man was, who was talking to her. She thinks Jesus is referring to the water in the well. Sir, she says, you have nothing to draw with. In other words, you don't have a bucket and the well is deep. So where then do you get this living water? Now, this indicates two things, brothers and sisters. She did not comprehend the spiritual meaning of Jesus' words. That's the first thing. Secondly, she may have been speaking sarcastically because she did not understand. Jesus makes a distinction, however, between the water in the well, physical water, and the living water that he gives, spiritual water, whereby if an individual drinks, or in this case, believes on, will never thirst, but shall be a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The Holy Spirit is what Jesus was speaking of. And so in time, in time, however, she will come to understand not only these words, my friends, but phrases such as Jesus being identified as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, according to John chapter 1, verse 29, God's chosen one, John chapter uh, 1, verse 34, and the Messiah, the Christ, John chapter 1, verse 41 she will eventually learn of his crucifixion, knowledge and truth that many Jews still did not accept or will not accept. But for now, the woman's curiosity grows as she follows up with another question. Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Though being called blue-blooded Jews, <clears throat> though being called by blue-blooded blue -blooded Jews as being unclean because of their mixed race, the woman nonetheless claims her descent and heritage to Jacob, or rather Israel. Again, Jesus does not answer her question concerning greatness, but continues to point to that which matters the most, brothers and sisters. Jesus' words are a continuation of his focused train of thought concerning what he had previously said to the woman. Our Lord has said earlier, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And he goes on to say, and this water shall do what? Shall be a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So Jesus stays focused on what he has started saying. 
whoever drinks of this water, Jesus says, will thirst again. He's talking about the woman, the water in the well. He says, will thirst again, but he says, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, will never thirst. This is interesting in that our Lord confirms the sealing of the Holy Spirit by the phrase, never thirst, never thirst. So it is clear, brothers and sisters, that our Lord is saying, or at least trying to get to a point and get a point across to the woman. He's telling her words that she will later remember after she is converted, having answered none of her questions it goes on to say, and not yet understanding the spiritual meaning of Jesus's words, the woman finally says this, perhaps out of curiosity. Now that Jesus has her attention, she says this, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. She sees in this water that Jesus offers a relief from having to come to the well. So she still hasn't gotten it yet. She's still working towards it, but she still hasn't grasped it yet. The woman will go on to possibly rather, in time, become Jesus's first evangelist. And although we don't have the privilege of personally, personally seeing Jesus as she did, we do, however, have the same words spoken to us in the scriptures as was spoken to the woman in Samaria, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so the physical water that she drinks and the water that we drink has nothing to do with salvation. That's the first thing that she needed to understand. But the living water that she and we receive when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as our savior is that promised Holy Spirit. It is that promised gift from God that our Lord said that we would receive. It is the same living water, if you will, that every confessed believer in Christ Jesus receives, which is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Besides the promise from God, he, the Holy Spirit, is promised to remain with the believer until the day of redemption. That's what Jesus was saying was that he will never thirst. The water that he gives, he says, once you have this water, you will never thirst again. That is the sealing of the Holy Spirit. And for every true believer, when you are sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption, you don't, uh, you don't get unsealed. You are sealed forever. That is why, and I've said this over and over again, a true believer in Christ Jesus cannot lose their salvation. In John chapter 4, verse 28 through 30, it says, the woman then left her water pot, she's gone, and went into, went and went her, went her way into the city and said to the men, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. Now, there's no reason not to believe that at this point, the woman did not in fact give Jesus some water. She probably did brothers and sisters. After all, he was the one who started that conversation by asking her for water. But before leaving, there were exchanges of conversation where our Lord explains to the woman the meaning of true worship. When the woman said, our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship, 
Jesus said to the woman, he said to her, woman, believe me, believe me. The hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain, he says, nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. Our Lord was saying that there will come a time when worshiping in physical structures will not be the requirement of the day. We can worship God anywhere. That's what Jesus is saying. We saying we don't we don't have to be in a physical structure to worship God. We we can worship God walking down the street. We can worship God having a cup of coffee. We can give praise to God singing. Jesus explains to her that the hour is coming. The hour is coming, he says, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. True believers will worship God, not necessarily in a building, but by virtue of the new birth, being born of the spirit, born of God, in the light of the revelation of truth in Christ that is found in the scriptures. True believers in Christ will worship God in the spirit, in their spirit, and in truth, which is what? It is the word of God, the word of God, the light and the revelation of the truth of Christ that is found in the scriptures. That is worshiping God in spirit and in the truth of the word of God. To worship God in spirit is vague enough to mean both the supernatural essence of Christian living and the means by which we can live it, which is through the Holy Spirit alone, alone, brothers and sisters. Only through the Holy Spirit can we do this. You cannot worship God in spirit without, without also worshiping him in truth. You can't do, you can't have one without the other. You cannot worship God in spirit without worshiping him in truth, which is the word of God. Jesus proceeds to further enlighten the woman by telling her that God is spirit. God is spirit describing sovereign freedom, which God alone has in contrast to men who are enclosed in a material world and not necessarily of God's nature. This is why we must therefore worship the Lord in our spirit, by which alone we can commune with the Holy Trinity. And so up until this point, there had been no mention of the Messiah up until this point. Our Lord's words, though not fully understood by the woman, leads her to say, I know that Messiah is coming. Now, now she's, 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 she's diverting. Now she is saying, okay, he hasn't answered any of my questions, but he said all of these other things. And so in her mind, she's thinking, okay, well, I know, you know, I know that Messiah is coming. And so she says, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, she says, he will tell us all things. So she is waiting for the Messiah to come. As all, as the Jews and everyone else who, uh, is from that line of Jacob, if you will, okay? So she says that when he comes, he will tell us all things. Now, in a sense, she says, she's saying to Jesus that when the Messiah comes, he will explain everything, the issue of worship, and ultimately reveal God's purpose. It is at this point, brothers and sisters, that Jesus wants the woman to understand this. He says, 
I who speak to you am he. I am the Messiah. That's what he's saying. The person that you were waiting for and everybody else has arrived. Now, one could say that this was Jesus' plan all along to reveal even to the outcasts, the hated of society, to let them know that the long-awaited Messiah had arrived. The self-disclosure of, of the self disclosure of the Messiah makes the Lord's immediate purpose complete. And that the woman's earlier perception of Jesus was indeed correct when she said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. But Jesus' revelation of the woman's past and the revelation of him being the Messiah makes it complete for the woman. She has now put two and two together. She now understands. And for this reason, she leaves the water pot and goes her way into the city proclaiming to the men who probably will proclaim to others that she has met the long-awaited Messiah. She says, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Now, to be clear, brothers and sisters, the scriptures are silent as to other things that Jesus had told the woman about herself, other than she had been married five times. So that's all that we know. Now, whatever conversation she had later, the scriptures are silent. But what we do know is that if that was all that She's, he said that convinced her that he had told her all that she had ever done. That would be very interesting. Only the fact that she had been married five times. And so as we conclude our study for today, our last verses come from John chapter four, verses 39 through 41. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. She is now officially an evangelist, I would call her myself. The woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, Jesus, they urged him to stay with them and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Because of his own word. So it wasn't just the blue-blooded Jews of Jerusalem who were waiting for the coming of the Messiah. The hated, the tax collectors and sinners, the hated Samaritans, the unclean mixed race of those in Samaria were also waiting, brothers and sisters. They too were of the lineage of Jacob. They too were Abraham's seed because they believed as Abraham believed. That's what made them Abraham's seed. They believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They believed the Messiah was coming. That's what makes us Abraham's seed, because we also believe on the Lord Jesus the Christ. We also believe that he is going to return again, that he is coming the second time. This occasion of the first time hearing that the Messiah had come to Samaria, and of all things, has spoken to a Samaritan woman with a questionable past, was enough to convince the men that she could be telling the truth. This was probably the first instance of evangelizing found in John's gospel. The fact that Jesus told her all that I ever knew, she said, made it even easier for others to believe that Jesus may have indeed been the Messiah 
or the prophet Moses spoke of in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 18, saying that the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. And so Jesus had already broken the rules, the Jews' rules, if you will, of not associating with Samaritans. He had already broken that rule. Now he does something even more despicable. He remains in Samaria for two more days. He's on that Samaritan soil, teaching them the things of God and of the kingdom of heaven. Later, our Lord would go and return to Galilee, and he will continue this teaching of the kingdom of heaven. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word because we know that your word is truth. We thank you for the Holy Spirit because we know that it is from the Holy Spirit that your word of truth is revealed to us. In this, Father, we give you the praise and the glory in the name of Jesus. We give you all praise and thanksgiving, honor and worship and love above all else. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Have a blessed and wonderful day, brothers in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Amen.